Okay, so today's session has got a very long title, Open Networking in Action, SDN, NFV, and OpenStack, and Cloud, all those things. <laughs> wow, okay. Bingo. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we have a, a very illustrious uh, lineup of panelists, none of whom I'm sure need uh, introducing, but I'm going to ask, themselves, ask them to introduce themselves nevertheless, and to say perhaps a little bit about their organizations and what it's contributing to this concept of open networking, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So starting with uh, Heather. I knew I should have not sat on the end. Um, hi, I'm Heather Kirksey. I head up uh, OPNFV, and we are an open source project um, working on NFV and really uh, focused on uh, uh, open source systems integration. So we do a lot of integration of um, uh, bits coming from some of these gentlemen's um, organizations, and then we do a lot of testing and then feed uh, features and requirements uh, back upstream to support NFE use cases. I'm Jonathan Bryce. Uh, I'm the executive director at the OpenStack Foundation, and uh, my background is, uh, is really strictly in cloud. I, I started the company that became the Rackspace Cloud and then helped to open source some of that technology to, uh, to, to get um, OpenStack started. And when we did that, you know, we were really thinking about traditional cloud workloads and, and everything. Um, but it's been, it's been really interesting to see the directions that people have taken those infrastructure concepts. And one of the most fascinating ones to me has been in the telecom world. And, uh, and I have a lot less experience than, uh, than my fellow fine panelists in that world. But uh, it's, been, it's been a great thing to, to kind of learn about and, and get exposed to. Cool. I guess I'm next. Uh, my name is Neela Jacques. I'm the executive director of the Open Daylight Project. And if uh, you look back about four years ago, um, two things sort of seemed true at once. On one hand, I think the entire industry said, we need a new way of controlling our networks. On the other hand, everybody had their favorite way. And so we had a world in which you had not one SDN solution, but 30 of them. And so 30 flavors, and as you can imagine, um, that doesn't work very well. So I think a number of the industry luminaries had this thought that says, hey, what if we brought all of these folks together and we could collaborate around a common platform? And then everybody can go off and actually build uh, their solutions around that. And the good news is we've gone from a world which was like this down to now just a few solutions out there with Open Daylight being by far the, the largest open solution out there. Um, the good and bad news about this has been that as we've shown that this model can work, we've actually found an expansion up and down the stack. And so more and more people are, are creating open source communities and open source projects. And, and that's, uh, that's certainly great. It means it puts a lot more pressure on all of us uh, here, as well as people who aren't here, to find ways of increasing collaboration to uh, overcome overlap and other things like that. That's what I'm really trying to focus on more of my time now. And I'm Brian Sullivan. I work for at and in, in the Domain 2 architecture and planning organization. We're, we're the organization that architects the at and integrated cloud and the, the overall uh, network function virtualization in which we're, we're re redeploying all our existing network services uh, over time. Um, and I guess what open networking has meant to us and our role in open networking has, has largely revolved around realizing that in order to you know, achieve the agility and time to market and speed and all those things that we needed to, to evolve beyond what we called domain one, the previous thing, right? Um, we, we had to go open, we had to go open source, uh, and we had to, to do things in completely new ways. For example, uh, network on demand was one of the first things that we did launch in, in, a, in a cloud environment. And that caused us to, you know, to adopt a lot of new methods and leverage a lot of new tools that you know, uh, disrupted a lot of what we did in the past. But it was a you know, foundational step in the right direction. And, and now we're expanding that, as uh, Neil said, up the stack you know, in, in a lot of different ways into the orchestration space as well. Well, thank you, everyone. So I'd like to start, I mean, as we've got up there, we've got SDN, NFE, OpenStack, and cloud, all very, very big topics. Um, and I think that for a pretty conservative industry, perhaps for any industry, but, but telcos have got the reputation of being particularly conservative, um, having all these things thrown at them at once is, is, is a pretty tall order. 
Um, AT&T has been, well, at least from the outside, it, it, it looks like the swan gliding serenely on the domain 2.0 waters, but we'll, we'll come to that in a, in, in a minute. But a number of operators have said to me, you know, these are just so hard, the, and there are so many moving parts, and they're all evolving so quickly. You know, we don't know which ones to, to, to choose, the standards aren't there. We're, we're used to standards, you know, and, and, and people sort of pontificating over those for two or three years or four years or even five years. Um, it, this stuff is just too hard. We, we're not going to be able to embrace it. Um, what, what's, your, what's your opinion of that, Brian? Should, should they just give up and go home or, or is this something that's really here to stay and, and, and they've got to sort of make this, this a leap across a very large chasm? Uh, well, we've been, uh, you know, a tier one operator forever, as long as I can remember, right? And so our, our role in this is different from a lot of other operators, right? I mean, as a member, for example, of the GSM Association, which has hundreds of operator members, right? The, the, the things that we do versus the things that other operators can do, you know, are quite different somehow, right? But uh, the, the fact is there's strength in numbers. Even for the tier two and tier three operators, right, the service providers, you have to realize that, that you have to be engaged because you can only make good choices if you understand. And there's only one way to be truly, you know, have an understanding is to be engaged, right? And, and then you can, through collaborative integration projects like the Open Platform NFV, Right? You can learn as an end user the things that you, know, you need to build a core technical team to make those good choices. Okay. Sure. Um, you know, it's a, little bit of, it's, it's a little bit like asking, does an aircraft carrier uh, have to be complicated? And to some extent, yes. Frankly, being able to land aircraft uh, on, a moving, on a moving ship in, uh, in the middle of the ocean is really difficult and requires tremendous amount of training and uh, specialization among people. And I think there's some element of which to run a, a tier one uh, telco is really, really hard. And we've got that down to a science now from the last 30 years. Now what we recognize is that the kinds of capabilities that we have today aren't going to be enough for the future. And as we move to the next chapter, we need to re reinvent it, but we can't, lose, um, we can't lose a lot of the things that we've achieved over, over time. So on one hand, there is tremendous complexity already in the existing system. There is certainly complexity in being able to reinvent many of the different pieces that all must come together. I also think, however, it behooves us to also simplify that inherently in innovation, innov innovation becomes messy, um, but you do need to be able to take all that innovation and actually run something that allows all of us to make calls, that allows all of us uh, to have video. And so I think that there's gonna be a great learning that's, gonna, that's going to continue to happen between the open source communities that are innovating faster than we've ever seen before and the operators that really need to deliver a service and make money on it today, not in 20 years. How many of you have heard of Corba? Okay, so a few. How many of you still depend on Corba for business critical functions in your company? So, <laughs> one. <laughs> you know, I, I think that, that uh, I, I, cause I, I, I thought of that because you, you mentioned about standards and waiting around for standards. And we actually used to do that in a lot, in a lot more areas of the technology world. But I think what every business is facing now is just this imperative to move more quickly. And, uh, and even though you know, something like Corba, which was meant to be a, a, a standard for communicating between systems, for sharing data and, and, uh, and, and application interaction, you know, even that is, is uh, not completely disappeared, but mostly, uh, that we actually have more interconnected systems than we've ever had before even though we don't have strictly defined standards like that. And I think that, that, uh, that you know, the, the telecom market, what's driving people to do these things, even though it is complicated and painful, is because they're facing that same business imperative to move more quickly and to compete in ways that they didn't you know, necessarily have to 15 or 20 years ago. So I, it, it is a little bit messier, you know, in, in terms of, of uh, like Mark Collier said yesterday, you know, how the chorizo is made. Um, but the, <laughs> the, uh, the end result is as you um, go through the, the transformation to be able to, to work in that environment, it actually does greatly increase your ability to move more quickly and to adapt and to roll out 
um, features. And I think, I think you know, we're, we're kind of in this, this transitional phase, which is, which is very hard, um, and which is gonna require change from both operators, but also you know, from organizations like OpenStack and Open Daylight and just open source in general to kind of figure out where the, the, um, the common ground is to make that happen. So I mean, kind of same thing. You know, I think the business imperative is there. You know, so it, it's hard. But if you take your toys and go home, you're if you're in business, you're not going to be in a very good business for very long. Um, but you know, I also kind of think about it a, a little bit differently, which is it's hard, but. It's the first time in a long time the telecom industry has been really interesting and fun, too. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, like change, you can look at change as hard or you can look at it as inspiring. There's so much more innovation uh, that we're seeing right now than we've seen in this space in a long time. And I think um, the enablement of that innovation and, and seeing excitement there, you know, we had at our OPNFE booth yesterday, we had people coming up saying that they wanted to be our interns. You know, when I'm thinking college kids, college kids were not dreaming of going to work, you know, in the telecom space for the past 20 some odd years, right? But the idea that interns were coming to approach us at our booth saying, what you're doing is really interesting and you are the person I would like to intern with, to me is just, you know, fresh and, and new and very exciting, so. That's kind of the way I think about it. <laughs> well, that's great. And uh, keeping with the business drivers, though, in the future, um, you know, there's a lot of hype around at the moment about, say, 5G, for example, Internet of Things. <coughs> Are these things, in your opinion, Brian, that, that, that can be done um, without virtualization? Or is virtualization a precondition for, for moving to that, that future vision? You know, the things evolve and, and we're in the first generation of, of virtualizing what we have, right? Um, we're, we, we're learning that, you know, it's hard. Um, there's a lot of embedded, you know, business around how things have been done for the past 20 years and, and that's not going to change overnight. But, but uh, um, uh, I've got to get this, this, this right because it was extremely important to what Chris Rice said at Open Daylight Summit, right? And, I, and I'm going to uh, uh, I would associate it to uh, a, a uh, analogy that you know, pets and cattle, right? Right. We have to move from from pets and and what Chris called snowflakes, right? <laughs> very special, very focused, one of a kind things that we're living with today, to a cattle environment, basically or Legos, right? Where you know things are, they're nothing special. You can get rid of them. Right, we have to get there because, in the long run, you know the the, the, the economics of, of doing all this are, are not going to work unless we can really break things down and evolve. So it's, I think it's an essential thing, uh, whether it's you know uh, VMs, containers, microkernels, or, or whatever. Right, that's just technology. Right, but clearly we we have to get things more broken down and much faster and and you know and agile. And I think those are key you know things that we're going to have to get to. Anybody else want to comment on that? Sure. Yeah. An example I often use is sort of like, I think the last big, great sort of example of kind of like the old style service and, you know, kind of that unique snowflake sort of thing was, was IPTV, um, you know, where sort of, you know, that was, I want to say like a six year sort of standards process. We designed this like beautiful, perfect network um, that really was going to enable IPTV and, and it was great. And they actually had to roll out a new network. And by that, I mean, people were digging up streets to lay down, you know, new things and um, new equipment. And by the time, you know, UVerse got rolled out, um, Oh, how was everybody getting most of their content? Oh, streaming, uh, you know, uh, Unicast streaming via Netflix, you know, and so this beautiful broad IP-based broadcast, you know, television system that we had designed and implemented and rolled out, you know, fortunately it's a good internet system that we can, you know, roll all over services over, but, you know, it just, it, it didn't work. So like the, the to, to the point of, you know, we can't, regard our services in that way. They can't, re they can't require these special networks every single service that we roll, we need a dynamic it's network. Like an artisan service. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So the hipsters in Brooklyn will really, yeah, really <laughs> like it, but, um, uh, but you know, it just, because it de-risks the, the service um, availability, you know, like the risk, to part of the reason service providers move so slowly with services is if you've got to like dig up streets and roll a new network for them, you have to have a pretty good ironclad ROI. Whereas if you can just start rolling out new software on sort of a cloud infrastructure, you can start playing, you know, and you can de-risk your, your, um, you know, your portfolio and your, your services um, economics. 
Just to add to that, I think that we've, we've shifted in terms of the determinant of winners and losers in our society. It used to be that the guy who figured out first that the automobile was going to be a big thing ended up being more successful than everyone else. And we've moved into a model where now people know what's coming. I mean, Microsoft knew that the smartphone was coming. They just weren't able to capitalize on it. AT&T knew that people were going to stream movies. It turns out that Netflix was able to execute. So if it's not knowing what is coming, what is it um, that determines success? It becomes execution. And from an execution standpoint, infrastructure inherently uh, underlays your ability to execute well. And so if we look at, I think, why so many people here at the OpenStack Summit <coughs> is a cloud, whether it's an internal cloud, a private cloud, a public cloud, a cloud infrastructure is inherently needed so that someone who sees, hey, I think the world is going in this direction can very quickly try things out, fail quickly, and, and move beyond it. That's certainly true on the network side, and I think uh, on the telcos, they're very fortunate, I think, to have uh, the ability to have a deep connection with all of us and with all of their customers. And so they have an ability to roll out and win all of these new markets. The question is, do they have the execution ability? And a lot of that comes down to the agility of their underlying infrastructure. And to answer your question, yes, I think virtualization is critical. I think it's necessary, but not sufficient. OK, Jonathan, did you want to add anything? Or? OK. So let's move on and then talk about how this transition can happen and, 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 and why it should really be open source led um, as, as it is at the moment. Um, Jonathan, do you have some you know, opinions as to why, you know, why Telcos yeah. should be involved in, in, in open source or be looking to open source? Well, I, I earlier, you know, I kind of um, talked down about standards a little bit, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it's not because I'm against uh, uh, just standards per se or the concept of people coming together to define what things look like. I'm actually completely pro that. And, uh, and we're throwing a giant event here in Barcelona that's oriented 100% around that concept. I think that, that open source is, is actually the evolution of how we work together. You know, it's not through standards bodies that then deliver um, you know, a spec that goes and gets implemented independently by different people. I think it's that process is, is kind of all collapsed into, into something where the definition of what we need to have and what it, what it looks like, how it gets built, and is, is kind of all done together collaboratively in the open. To me, that is, that's actually um, proving out to be the best model for, for technology development. Now, it's different. It's very different. And, uh, and I hear it all the time, you know, not just from, from telecom operators, but from other users who are, um, you know, who are, are very attracted to certain components of that. Um, but you know they're they are confused or, or put off by other pieces of it. But I think that if you look at at uh, at kind of the the time to execution, as Neil was saying, which was a really good point that you were making, um, the by focusing on open source and kind of implementation from the beginning, uh, you actually can can fail faster and adjust and get to the working iteration more quickly than if you um, just go through the process of of you know, years or decades of a product rollout. And so um, to me, open source is, is, a, is, is a really critical component for, um, for anything that, that is meant to be a massively deployed, uh, diversely deployed technology solution now. OK, but Heather, shouldn't telcos lead this to their vendors? I mean, it's, after all, that's what they've, they've done for many years. You're setting me up for one of my favorite quotations. It's from Machiavelli, the prince, which is, um, a prince who depends on a contract army can never be secure. Um, so, wow. <laughs> and, and I, and, I, <laughs> and uh, it's one of my favorite lines. <laughs> but I mean, and I think that really the dynamics of the telecom industry had gotten that way, that the, the operators had sort of become, they were dependent on their vendors for their R&D, which created a very, weird dynamic because in a certain way there was then we don't we're not sure if we trust you doing our r d so we're going to yell at you a lot um but we're still depending on you to do our r d um i used to work for a vendor in the telecom space um so but you know i think sort of the operators getting their hands dirty and by the way brian is a is a shining example of this um and really um being able to do some of their own development work, not that, not that they're still not going to buy things from vendors, but they understand sort of the, 
the sausage making uh, better. They understand the strengths and limitations. Um, they understand the technology being used better. And I think it, it actually, it changes the dynamic of some of the relationships in a positive way. I think it also enables the operators to choose pieces that they might want to develop on their own. You know, they like say AT&T with Ecom. Um, it, it allows them to make decisions about what they are going to buy versus what they're going to build versus what they might build collaboratively. And um, I think it just, it makes the entire process of sort of um, designing, implementing, and operating their networks, it just makes it, I think it makes it, it's better for them, is, is, is my view. Okay, so Brian, we'd like to hear from you as the as the operator member of the panel, um, uh, not just about you know what is the value <coughs> of contributing. Uh, it's not just consuming, but but it's actually contributing. But also you know uh, your own views. Obviously, you're going to you're talking about making ecomp uh, open source. So if you could take us through some of the thinking behind that as well, that would be very interesting. Um. Well, the value of contributing, again, to come back to the point, is that you have to be educated, right? And, and unless you contribute, uh, you won't be educated. You learn by doing. Uh, it, and there, there are many forms of contribution as well. I mean, you don't have to be necessarily a code contributor. You can be a user. You can provide feedback. You can participate in testing. You know, you can be part of a community that, you know, uh, supports end user communities, et cetera. Um, so test, labs, test labs, test labs, Ferris test labs. Test, test labs, you can provide resources like, you know, like many people do in, in OPNFE and, and the OSIC, right, does to, to the community. Um, you know, the, the, the role, though, of, of uh, um, you know, everybody in the ecosystem is changing. And, you know, the, the, the relationship between operators and vendors is, is changing as well. We're becoming much more partners, collaborators, right? Um, you know, we, we don't want to, you know, necessarily make everything. Uh, we don't, and even if we do make very, very substantial things like Ecomp, you know, we probably want to partner with people long term in maintaining them, developing and taking them further, you know, and, and, um, you know, there, there are many different solutions to, you know, the, these sorts of uh, needs. You know, the orchestration, the overall orchestration umbrella, for example. You know, and, and we, we don't want to necessarily maintain, a, you know, a, a, a point solution, right? It, it, it should be, to come back to Chris Rice's point, it should be basically Legos that we use to solve the problem of overall orchestration, et cetera. So in order to do that, we have to collaborate. You know, we're going to have partners, we're going to have, you know, uh, vendor partners, et, et cetera. We're going to have, you know, community partners as well. So the, the, the dy dynamic is changing for sure, but, but I think it's, it's a positive change. And as, as if I was, you know, in a vendor community, I wouldn't really worry that much because there are many ways to form value as a vendor. And, and, and you know, selling a product, you know, for example, differ differentiating on a product is only one way. Nina, we were talking the other day, and you were giving me lots of really good examples of what operators are actually doing mm -hmm. with open daylight. Um, can you, you know, perhaps tell the audience with some of the ways that they're participating and what they're doing, operators particularly? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and before I go into right into the example, I want to say one quick thing, which is the big difference in your question about open source versus just going with a vendor is the developer user intimacy that we get in a community like this, you cannot get in a vendor relationship. It's a little bit like trying to collaborate with somebody by sending letters back and forth to Timbuktu. Um, there's just an inherent latency that you get when you have to go through product managers, um, as well as going through you know, technical user advisory groups that exist within corporations. While here, and we've seen this very much with AT&T as an example, that's where I'm gonna start with my example, um, we actually get people who say, hey, I have a need. Can you make this better? Are you going to do this? No, I'm going to start it. And so, for example, if we look at AT&T, AT&T is a great example of participation in open daylight. On one side, you've got something like Ecomp. AT&T takes open daylight, puts it at the heart of their next generation um, infrastructure delivery platform, puts it in production two years ago, while the, the project itself is still uh, evolving. 
right, and giving us feedback the entire time. At the same time, you're actually getting little point contributions and participation, not just feedback on the overall, but a, hey, what we need is a Yang model uh, authoring tool. Wait, you don't have one? No one's creating it? You know what? I'm going to find a developer within at and I'm going to write that piece of functionality. I'm going to offer it into the community and let you, Neela, go find other people to join me and help me to do it. And so what we've seen is engagement from at and from someone like Chris Rice, right, who's very, very senior, down to individual developers who I may never know about but are active in the community asking questions. That's a great example of someone doing something like this. We've seen, we saw the same thing, uh, KT in Korea. Um, one day was talking to me and said, you know, Open Daylight seems a lot weaker than that other project in, uh, in transport. Um, why aren't you doing more in transport? And you know, you get a little bit defensive and you say, well, you know, the community invests in what it wants to. And you give sort of your stock answer as an ED. Hey, if it's really important to you, why don't you come and contribute and participate? I'll help you to do that. And they go away and you know that nine out of 10 times that you never hear about it ever again. In KT's case, they found a group of developers. They went, ahead, they went ahead. They built out the functionality that they wanted for themselves. They deployed, and they're in production now using Open Daylight to shorten the time from bid to deployment of their customers. But at the same time, they also proposed a new project in transport, and it's in the latest release of Open Daylight. So what you get in open source is that ability to not only consume, but also give feedback and also produce. It, people think when you say developer user, you mean vendor um, customer. No, you've got developers at both, um, and you've got users at both, really. OK, well, thank you. Now, I'd like to get a little bit more specific here. Um, I mean, a lot of uh, people that I speak to you know, when, they, when they're talking about open source, um, there's an excuse which may not be entirely true, but it's, it's, it's a little bit valid nevertheless, which is that, well, can we really run telecoms networks on open source software as it currently, in, in its current state? And of course, they always point to OpenStack as the, uh, as, as the example. And uh, you know, I've seen OpenStack uh, make tremendous strides in supporting NFV since I first started looking at it, which I think was back at the uh, round about the uh, Ice House release, and of course since then we've had we've had Metaka <coughs> and, and now Newton, which are really sort of pushing pushing on in in, in very many ways. But still, um, speaking to a big tier one European operator last week, who said, "Well, OpenStack will never be done," and the kind of subtext was, "We're not sure ever when we're really going to deploy it." Um, so, Jonathan, what, what still needs to be done, do you think? What, what boxes still need to be ticked to make, to make operators really overcome this excuse? Uh, it's, a, it's a really good question. I mean, I, the statement that OpenStack will never be done is, is true. Um, and, but that's actually a good thing. <laughs> Linux kernel's not done yet yes, either, and yet some pe somehow people manage to use it. Um, yeah. <laughs> and and I, I think that uh, that you know it, it gets to kind of that that cultural difference of there's there's we do releases and uh, and those um, end up in uh, in downstream products from from vendors, which is a really good thing for for consumption. Um, but uh, but some of that you know is is uh, is again that that mind, mindset change that, that that needs to happen. Uh, at the same time, in terms of specific things. Um, there are differences in some of these telecom workloads from uh, definitely from sort of cloud ready workloads, which is where OpenStack started, um, enterprise workloads, which is kind of the next step uh, in terms of OpenStack's development iteration, and, uh, and you know, running data networks and, uh, and voice networks. And, and um, I think that, uh, that uh, similar to, to those other workloads, it's not about when, you know, when OpenStack is going to be ready to be used in, in telcos. It's really when is, when is a telecom going um, to, to be comfortable using OpenStack for the, the things that it is ready for. It's not an all or nothing thing. This is a, a, a shift like they've been talking about where um, you know, all of the R&D and all of the packaging doesn't just happen with, with vendors anymore. Um, and so what that means is that, uh, that um, Users of, of open source software in general, you know, not just OpenStack, they need to uh, they need to be informed and educated enough to know. Okay, I can run this workload on this set of tools now. 
Um, and, and what we see is a growing number of those things that, uh, that, that different operators are, are running. Um, you know, AT&T uh, initially started out with, with more of that enterprise type workload in terms of some of their first developments that they were doing with, with OpenStack. And uh, at Deutsche Telekom, similar thing, but you know, they've moved into, into network workloads now. Um, DT runs uh, a variety of different workloads through different European countries. Um, that include, you know, some some voice, also some security services, things like that, and I think that uh, that that it really there is not there's never going to be a blanket answer for everyone, and you have to invest into uh, it doesn't have to be code contribution. It, there are a lot of different ways, but you do have to invest in these communities if you want to use them and get the most value out of it. And the minimum level of investment is getting informed and understanding, um, you know, how uh, different technologies align with with your with your needs and your, you know, kind of current state. Okay, so Heather, you're right in the in the forefront of testing a lot of this stuff for for telcos. I mean, what what do you see that needs you know that could be addressed um, in terms of uh, making people feel more comfortable? Um, well, I mean, part of it, I think, as, as Jonathan was saying, is, is certainly cultural. Um, you know, from the perspective of especially that sort of like never going to be done. Of, of course not, the, the world is never done, you know? Um, and, you know, Linux kernels celebrate its 25th anniversary, it's, you know, and it's changes, you know, constantly, you know, I mean, they release every week, right? So the fact that things are constantly changing means that new requirements are coming in and you're adapting to evolve to them. And I think that it is that, that transition from a, oh, now I have a box that is good enough for me to put here to I have software that's going to continually evolve as my business evolves and as the world evolves around me. And I think that is a big cultural shift. Um, you know, in terms of, you know, I, I think sort of in our Colorado timeframe uh, for OPNFE, I think we really started seeing some maturity around some of the requirements um, for beginning to run more telecom workloads. Um, you know, some of the, the fault management capabilities that we saw in the demo yesterday um, coming from groups like Open Daylight, some of the layer two, layer three VPN capabilities and um, SFC functionality. Um, this was the first release where we were able to, you know, we had some basic IPv6 support last time, but this is the first time you're beginning to see multiple projects, you know, sort of in the stack, like really properly support IPv6, um, which is, you know, a necessity for operators. So, you know, a lot of those baseline functions, for us this time in our release, it was a lot of incremental functions necessary to run um, applications. And, and we saw, you know, these sort of, you know, definite strides in them. I mean. You know, probably at the end of the day, Brian's a better arbiter of this, you know, um, uh, you know how rad we are question. But I, I think we're certainly getting to the place where, you know, to Brian's point, you can start, certainly you start running certain workloads. And, and stuff is, you know, in the just over 18 months I've been in OPNFV, things are quite impressively radically improved um, in, in a fairly short time frame. Well, well I'm going to uh, let uh, Brian do the answer. <laughs> they're doing? Uh, well, they're doing fantastic. I think it's, it's uh, you know, we, we went from, you know, one scenario uh, that in, in the first release that I think a week after it was released probably was hard to get running again <laughs> <laughs> to, to several scenarios in the next release and to like 37 in the third release, right? And this is different combinations of components, right, which, which show the, you know, the flexibility and the, the openness of the, the overall project, right? You know, come on, come all, bring your resources, you know, and, and we'll, we'll prove that it works, sort of thing, right? Um, but as far as OpenStack and its readiness and, and, you know, reluctance, et cetera, to deploy it and all that sort of stuff, I mean, it's, it's fundamental. Yeah, we started out with in, enterprise, uh, um, you know, workloads, et cetera, but, but it also runs, you know, mission critical applications as part of our, you know, NFV uh, uh, program. Uh, and, um, you know, it, it needs some, particular focus, right? And we know it's not done yet for these things. It needs, you know, massive scale. It needs, you know, uh, not just OpenStack, but overall the NFE environment needs, you know, really, really good performance to make up for the virtualization penalty. Uh, you know, it needs also to be able to scale, scale down really low, right? For, for putting clouds inside central offices and at small cell sites and things like that, right? Um, you know, the security of it needs to be much stronger. Right, uh, because it's going to run our network and it can't be hackable at all, um, you know. And and uh, 
you know, there's a, there's a number of things like that. You know, it, it, but we'll, but we'll, we'll get there. It's it's just a matter of you know recognizing what it needs and, and communicating as a, as a as a group, like we have this large contributing OpenStack operator group we we formed. You know, with others, and that's giving us an, another way to get the voice out there into OpenStack as as to what we really need. You know, coming up with it. So. If I can jump in, I want to give uh, a little bit of a provocative answer to this. Um, you know, I think the question, in a sense, is the wrong question. Um, the assumption, if you're asking, is, is OpenStack ready for telcos, positions OpenStack as a product. And you could ask the same question about Open Daylight. You could ask the same pro uh, question about any open source product. And I would argue that when we start to think about open source platforms as products, per se, we're shooting ourselves in the foot. You know, was Open Daylight ready for production two or three years ago? No, but yet it was at at and And the truth is, we come together to build a platform, and that platform is leveraged to build a solution. In some cases, the open source is so advanced that you don't need very much to build a solution. In other cases, you may need to build half the solution uh, yourself. In some cases, the end user is going to pick up the open source bits and build a solution for itself. In some cases, they're going to do that but pay somebody else to do a piece of it, or they're going to go to a vendor and buy a solution that's been built on that. But inherently, it is the wrong question to ask and to evaluate an open source project as a fully formed solution. To, to go further than that, if the majority of end users looked at open source projects as full and complete solutions, and therefore, hey, this is a really cheap way of solving my problem, you'd completely destroy the business case for the vast majority of the, the people who currently pay the developers to continue to fund the development of those open source projects. Um, developers aren't free. Other people who work and support aren't free either. Um, and if we lived in a world in which users would pay for 100% of all the development on the, on the open source product, maybe we could have a world in which, um, in which you basically just look at the open source project as being the primary source of where you are. In the current world where we are, we really need to remember that what we're building is common technology elements and platforms and toolkits that people then are going to leverage to build solutions for themselves. And there has to be money there that, to be able to fund that development. Well said, Neela. Okay, so I just want to finish with, um, with, with, with a question around the apparent overlap between a lot of open source initiatives, this kind of land grab for adjacent areas, you know, which is, which is perfectly, you know, that people identify things, people identify you know, the same things at the same time, but then it's a question of how do you govern that in an essentially ungovernable process where you don't want to kill that, that innovation. Um, it's particularly striking, I think, um, with, the, with, the, with the whole sort of idea of the NFV Mano, that, that sort of very nebulous orchestration layer that sits above OpenStack. But just wonder, just would like the panel's thoughts, starting with Heather, um, as to you know, how, can, how can we control this? So Because people, operators are concerned about where they should put their, their, their efforts. And, which one's going to win? Maybe it's a legacy of the old standards thinking, but nevertheless, you know, how do we address this, this problem? Yeah, so I kind of got two answers. Which One is which, yeah, so put your efforts in the community that you think you are going to be successful in. You know, um, you don't necessarily have to play in, in all of them. Um, uh, you know, where, where do you think you will be getting value for yourself and you know, what aligns with your strategy and, and business model? Um, you know, there are, you know, there are a lot of uh, different groups out there, many of them because they're working on different parts of an ever-growing stack, and some because they are taking a different approaches to some similar piece of the stack like Mano or, um, you know, SDN controller or something like that, um, which I think is fine because we're in early days of, of NFV in a lot of ways. Um, and so the fact that people have multiple competing ideas about how certain things like, you know, the future of you know, OSS BSS, which in some ways informs your opinion of what Mano looks like. Of course, there are different ideas, and I and I think that that innovation 
um, is, is a good thing. So it's not so much that it needs to be controlled, it needs to be, I think, maybe understood and, and calmed a little bit, which is, you know, sort of the second part of my answer is that's sort of what OPNFE um, really does, is because we are an integration project, uh, because we're not trying to pick winners, because it is voting with your feet, you know, if you care about a particular technology, are you willing to put the time, effort, energy into getting it integrated into a scenario? Um, and then when you know we run all of our tests against it, are you willing to take those bug reports and feed them back in and improve the software based on what our testing has found? Um, so you know, part of what we are part of what we're doing is we're not picking winners, but we are sort of enabling that um, voting with your feet, um, enabling the sort of seeing how well things do integrate, seeing how well things test, um, and testing with all of them to sort of give them, you know, kind of give multiple upstream communities sort of a level playing field to. Um, you know, sort of show how they're meeting needs um, and being react, you know, reactive as a community or, or not. Um, and, you know, eventually some things will die and that's fine too. Yeah. Uh, so I think that, that uh, I just want to echo what you said about, you, you didn't say pick the tool or the technology, you said pick the community yeah. that you think, you know, and-, and uh, I, I and, did do it on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, when, when OpenStack started, there were other, Open source cloud platforms that um, you know that, that had a technical head start in different areas, uh, but but none of them had a focus on uh, growing a healthy community. And you know at this point, uh, OpenStack has eclipsed them. Uh, and and I think that that with open source, the community is the driver for the success or failure of the open source project over the long term. It might be able to to last for a year or two or three. Um, in, in a model that's driven by a single vendor or by a closed team. But the only way that an open source project survives and thrives for 25 years like Linux is by being very community driven. And so that's, to me, that's the thing to, to look for above all else if you're, if you're looking across you know, different open source solutions. The other point that, that I would say is, um, is yeah, don't fear the, uh, <laughs> don't fear the, the kind of variety in some of these areas, because this is so early on, and as you go higher up stacks too, um, you're going to have more variation because there are uh, there are more uh, differences between development languages than there are between operating systems. You know, there are more differences between uh, between you know diff different kinds of workloads that are going to run on top of those, and uh, and so I think it's it's actually fine to have to have variation and variety um, over time. The market. Uh, will will sort of give people their niche, or they will die and go away, and uh, and and it will get settled. But you know what what it shows is just um, how new it is, and and how much experimentation there is left to do. I was going to say the the enemy of successful open source is the desire for control. We see this everywhere when a when an individual comes in with a great idea, um, that creates that creates the spark that lights the innovation. But that innovation will die if they're not able to get other people to work with, to contribute, to leverage that code. That is certainly true within an open source project, and that's true um, between open source projects. And I think you know, this, is, this is the tough challenge that we all have up here, is how do you, on one hand, allow people to come in, and they have something that they want to do, and they've got to feel safe that they can come in, and this is, a, this is a good garden for their plant to grow, right? On the other hand, if what you simply do is allow every single person to go in and collaborate with themselves, and then collaborate via stapler with the release, you're gonna fail. <laughs> and we see this, we see this every time when people do end up in their own island. We, I spend a lot of my time explaining to people, hey, I'm not seeing a whole set of people coming to you. Don't think that just because you made a release vehicle that you've achieved your goals. You achieve your goals when other people uh, join and contribute. You meet your goals when other people take your code and integrate in what they have. You meet your goals when a vendor puts it in their product or an end user actually deploys it to solve a problem. And that's actually a lot harder and it requires, it requires people um, who are willing to let go of some control. It requires the facilitation of community and I think we spend a lot of time trying to do that. 
it's hard enough within a project, it's even harder between projects. And we see situations in which, of course, each of us is really excited about our, our own community and our own way of things, and we can all, we're all human too, we can all fall into that trap. And so continuing to invest in saying, where does it make sense? Where should we collaborate? Where should we compromise with each other? If we don't do that, we will fail and people will go back to the ultimate non-collaborative model, which is proprietary software. So Brian, you're the one who's having to uh, place bets. <clears throat> what do you think? Um, well, I, it's a, I think it's a natural thing. As Heather said, this is a nascent you know, uh, change in the market, right? Um, and it's really not a problem that you have multiple, you know, you know, you know, co collaboration or whatever you want to call it, <laughs> right? <laughs> collaboration. Um, yeah. And because it's, it's natural. I mean, if, if we, we have a globe, right? Because of culture, because of geography, because of ambition, you know, because of, you know, uh, um, people following their own goals, right? And, and developing things internally and, and, you know, seeing it grow up and saying, oh, I, I want to I put this out there, you know? You know, we have these multiple, you know, projects in the same space coming up. And as long as there's enough bandwidth inside the, the overall market to support them, it's really not a problem, especially as, you know, we had this, uh, right after ONS last time, we had this uh, um, uh, uh, meetup of the um, sort of Mano thing, but it was, it was about, you know, cross SDO information modeling, and then there was, uh, you know, uh, orchestration, right? And we, we got together after ONS and, you know, across all these projects, we said, look, we've got to reuse as much as possible out of the stuff, the, the fundamental components of, of what we're doing here so that, so that we don't have to reinvent, you know, 10 times, right? As long as these communities get together and, and they do try to, to find out the opportunities for convergence and collaboration, right, we, we're, we're going to win, right? And so, you know, when we go open with ECOMP, I'm sure the same thing is going to happen at some point, right? We're, it's going to be a give and take, and we're going to have things, you know, coming in and going out, and, and it, you know, it's just a natural thing that the market has to work through. And in the end, if there's four or five different solutions, large solutions to the same problem, if that serves the market, then it's okay. Well, I'd just like to say thank you very much to all my panelists, Heather, Jonathan, Neela, and Brian. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline.